This video is sponsored by Manscaped. You been playing this. chess? Man, I'm playing chess, Othello. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's a good back name. Game. <laughs> Drizzy Drake has made it no secret how much of a pusher T and clips fan he was earlier in his career. All the way back in 2009, he was telling Peter Rosenberg that his favorite albums were Kanye's Graduation and the Clips' Lord Willing. Clips' Lord Willing? I used to listen to oh, that record down. My God. I love that record. Hell, if that wasn't enough, a young Drake famously copped a signed pusher T microphone from eBay. One day I was looking for like autograph stuff from Clips because I was like a really, really big Clips. Wow. This guy in Virginia that supposedly had a, a microphone that Pusha T used during the show. It was like plastic, but it had his autograph. I used to pretend I was doing interviews on the red carpet and uh, perform all the clip songs in my basement with the mic. Yeah, dog, you know, I pretend to do interviews with it, rap into it, put it in my butthole. But of course, we all know Drake's come up was facilitated in a big way by his day one mentor, Lil Wayne, who signed Drake to his own Young Money imprint under the umbrella of Birdman's Cash Money Records. And considering how much success Drake has had since signing with Wayne and Birdman, you can just imagine how loyal Drake must be to his day ones. Hell, considering how much money these three have made together, I'm surprised we haven't seen Drake, Wayne and Baby doing a three-way French kiss. In fact, I'm pretty sure that kissing the star on Birdman's baldy little head gives you five years of good luck and no royalties. Anyway, as we saw in the previous video on the long feud between Pusha T and Drake's mentor Lil Wayne, Push and Wheezy had fallen out all the way back in the noughties, apparently after Birdman does what Birdman does best and stiff Pharrell Williams on some royalties. And it was from this mythical unpaid invoice that things escalated into a full-blown clout war when Pharrell and Pusha T begun to accuse Lil Wayne of jacking their fashion style when he swapped in his oversized jerseys for bathing ape hoodies. Wayne rebuffed skateboard P and Pusha T, saying he was the one that made bait pop and inferring that Pusha ain't safe in New Orleans. After this, Pusha ended up taking a big old dookie on Lil Wayne with the scathing diss track Exodus 23-1. Wayne, of course, tried to counter Pusha T's diss with his embarrassing lackluster response ghoulish, which was universally panned by rap fans, placing it truly where it belonged in the hip-hop beef dustbin, alongside Meek Mill's Wanna Know, Machine Gun Kelly's Rap Devil, and of course Soldier Boy's Fuck Bow Wow. <laughs> Okay, I'll take that back. Fuck Bow Wow is fire. Anyway, after handing Lil Wayne an Oliver Tree scooter-sized L, Pusha T went on to drop the song New God Flow, where he set his intentions clearly, saying that he wanted three heads on his mantelpiece. Lil Wayne's, Birdman's, and of course, the new cash money wonder boy, Drake. And now, a word from our sponsor. This video is brought to you by Manscaped.com. Manscaped has created the first all-in-one manscaping kit that makes manscaping safe and easy. Nobody wants to slice through their family jewels. It's painful, it hurts, and it's traumatic. No way. I've been shaving my balls all wrong. wrong. Been shaving my balls it's all so wrong. wrong. But with Manscaped, the hair's all gone. gone. With Manscaped, the hair's all gone. gone. I've been shaving my balls all wrong. wrong. Been shaving my balls it's all so wrong. wrong. With Manscaped, the hair's all gone. gone. With Manscaped, the hair's it's all gone. gone. First time I tried to shave my nuts, nuts. to trim my shrubs, would it take me months? Snip, snip. Did it all wrong, got razor cuts. But Manscaped's got that amazing stuff. stuff. The lawnmower 3.0 gets me high. It's got a built in light, yes. so you never lose sight. Right. And oh. it's shower safe, man, I'ma shave all night. night. And it's got advanced skin safe technology to protect wow. your anatomy and biology <laughs> from unwanted cock and ball choppery. Chop. The only cut I like is a price cut, and they'll give you 20% off. off with my code TLR20 at manscaped.com. Link in description, go, go I've been shaving my balls all wrong. Been shaving my balls so all wrong. wrong. But with Manscaped, the hair's all gone. gone. With Manscaped, the hair's so all gone. gone. I've been shaving my balls all wrong. wrong. Been shaving my balls so all wrong. wrong. With Manscaped, the hair's all gone. gone. With Manscaped, the hair's so all gone. gone. Yeah. Come on, guys. Wu-Tang told you to protect your neck and Trap Lord Ross is telling yeah. you protect your balls. Support the channel. Don't cut yourself. Yeah. Cut 20% off the price with the code TLR20. Link in description. Yeah. Thanks, Manscaped. Yeah. Peace. Yeah. Now, you might have blinked and completely missed the fact that Drake had already gone at Pusha T on behalf of his crew before Ghoulish and before Exodus. Drake had already thrown his hat into the ring by sneak dissing Pusha T on the track Dreams Money Can Buy all the way back in May 2011. Without mentioning him specifically by name, Drake appears to acknowledge his past admiration for Pusha, saying that his favorite rappers either lost it or they ain't alive, and eliminating any doubt that he was going at Pusha T, with a line suggesting that the person going after him is also going after Wayne and Birdman. 
and then wrapping things up by clearly declaring his allegiance to Wayne and his label Young Money Cash Money, aka YMCMB, aka Young Money Cash Money Billionaires. It's gotta be done. Anyway, Petty Pusher was naturally offended by these not so sneaky disses and proceeded to diss Drake on the very same beat, dropping his own diss track called Don't Fuck With Me around four months later in September 2011. And in contrast to Drake just dropping three sneaky lines on a song that's overall about his wild success, Pusher decided instead to go line after line with accusations and put downs aimed at Drake, suggesting that Drake is a lyric stealer years before Meek Mill would do the same thing with disastrous consequences. Dropping double entendres that could be interpreted as referencing Drake's lyric stealing and use of ghostwriters, as well as potentially referring to Birdman's royalty stealing business practices, something that Push elaborated on sometime later. You know, you know, if you steal something, then that's just, that's just corny. And like, if you steal something and you're stealing it like contractually, like that's like the lowest form of a thief. It's like a, like a cat burglar. He mentions rappers on their sophomores thinking they're boss lords. Potentially a reference to Drake dropping his second album, Take Care, within two months of this diss song being released. Of course, let's not forget the fact that that original Dreams Money Can Buy track was a promo release to build hype for Drake's sophomore album. And of course, that thinking they're boss lords line fits in nicely with the fact that over the years, Drake has built a reputation for having people beaten up as part of disputes. Something he, of course, wore on his sleeve later on in his career with the track Mob Ties. Excellent foreshadowing here, Pusha. I mean, this is just one of the many pieces of evidence where Pusha T has so much good foresight for what was going to happen later on this beef. It kind of makes me think that he is the real rap game Terminator. I have been sent back in time to save the rap game from the Ghost Rider 2000. Push then goes on to drop another great line, which I personally love because it references one of my favorite underrated comedians. He says, Chappelle show all of you Neil Brennan's sketch comedy who was for real penning. A reference to the fact that while rarely seen on screen, Dave Chappelle's writing partner, Neil Brennan, Brennan wrote a huge amount of material for their infamous sketch show Chappelle Show, once again referencing Drake's need for a ghostwriter and tendency to take credit for other people's work, in a similar way to how some people would have perceived Dave Chappelle did to Neil Brennan. Though for the record, Dave and Neil did actually have a pact not to tell anybody which part of the shows they specifically wrote, so from a purely comedy perspective this lyric isn't actually accurate. And despite their brief feud after Dave Chappelle fled to Africa, it seems like Neil and Dave are on good terms now, and I would say that Neil Brennan's Netflix special Three Mics is actually one of the most groundbreaking breaking pieces of conceptual stand-up comedy in a decade. Sorry, I geeked out there for a second. Elsewhere in Don't F With Me, Pusher also disses Drake's fashion sense, saying the talk don't match the leather and the swag don't match the sweaters. Apparently a reference to Drake's universally panned granddad sweater that he wore at the 2011 VMAs. Now, I personally find this lyric particularly ironic because I remember having bought a similarly ugly cardigan from Pusher T's own clothing brand Play Clothes when I was a teenager, but anyway. Pusher also said that daddy's MIA like a dolphin, which could be a reference to Drake's dad Dennis walking out on him as a kid, which you best believe is getting referenced later on in this beef. But of course, it's not a push a T bar without a hidden second meaning, because he is potentially also using this line to hint at Birdman, Wayne's fake daddy, of course, eventually going MIA by running off with everybody's royalties. Yes, push a T went hard on Drake all the way back in 2011, people. Y'all just missed it. But this ain't over, not by a long shot. <laughs> Pusha T's devastating diss track Exodus 23-1 hit Lil Wayne's chest harder than a double dose of activists on an empty stomach. But that doesn't mean Exodus didn't also include a few early prods towards Drake too. There's of course the iconic line about being signed to one guy who signed to another guy who signed to three guys, which is of course in many ways just as if not more disrespectful to Drake, who himself is signed to Wayne. So if Exodus was an early hint that Pusha was planning to go at Drake, it was Pusha's verse on that track New God Flow that was the declaration of war. We actually left off in the last video about Pusha and Wayne's beef in a Hip Hop Wired interview, where Pusha made it specifically clear that he was dissing Cash Money and Birdman on that track New God Flow with Kanye West. And Pusha T made it very clear in this interview that this was a direct warning to Drake, essentially saying that he is ready to step up and get involved in that proxy war that had already been bubbling between Drake and Kanye. Push said in this interview that Kanye is at a level where he shouldn't even respond to Drake, saying that he should just leave the rap game Terminator to dish out cold hard justice. I am the Pusha T1000. Any attempts to diss good music would be met with immediate termination. Now, the Kanye Drake beef is a whole other saga, and if you're not up to speed on that, go watch my one hour video on it. But as we learned by the fact that Pusha T was ready for war when his previous label boss Pharrell got shafted by Cash Money, we know that Pusha T is fiercely protective of whoever is giving him his opportunities. So after signing Pusha in 2010, Kanye had clearly got himself some bona fide microphone muscle. And this is exemplified further by the fact that in New God Flow, Pusha says that he is coming to be to Ye what Shine was to Diddy back in 99. 
point, i.e. a hot-headed shooter, metaphorically of course. So Push used his lines on New God Flow to say that he wants to take Wayne, Birdman and Drake's heads. Following it up with a line, fuck em yay, fuck em yay, I wouldn't piss on him with Graham Marin A. Which I personally think is another cryptic reference to a 2010 incident where one of T.I.'s buddy allegedly pissed, that's right, pissed, on Drake at a movie theater. And after getting the R. Kelly treatment, apparently Drake ran out of the movie theater like a little bitch because he didn't want that smoke with T.I.'s boys. Not very mob tied, is it? Pound cake, man's moving like a urinal cake out here. But hey, it's unconfirmed that that's what that line is specifically referencing. But hey, even Drake will tell you himself that Pusha T is one of the smartest lyricists in the game. Now, obviously this violation wasn't gonna slide. So in September, 2013, Drake drops his song, Tuscan Leather. I hope he wiped the piss off his jeans before he sat on that leather. Anyway, this song seemingly contains lines pointed at Push, responding to his lyrics on Exodus and New God Flow. He says he's just as famous as his mentor, referring to his relationship with Lil Wayne, potentially inferring that Pusha T hasn't reached the heights of his mentor, Kanye, then adding with reference to Lil Wayne, but that's the boss, so don't get sent for, suggesting that his loyalty is still with Wayne and that those disrespecting Wayne can catch some heat. And Drake goes on to drop several more tough guy lines, suggesting that he's not to be messed with by the likes of Push and Kanye, saying that his ops are jumping in front of bullets not meant for them, a possible warning to Pusha not to defend Kanye or he might catch a stray, and saying that he has a hot temper so the outcome of this beef will be scary for Pusha. Going on to say that people are hating on Drake for no reason, but he's about to give him a reason, and saying that his enemies are just bench players sitting around running their mouth like they think they're starter players. Perhaps suggesting that Pusha T isn't really pulling his weight musically over at Good Music. And then Drake says, Tom Ford Tuscan Leather smelling like a brick. Degenerates, but even Ellen love our shit. Now of course the song is named Tuscan Leather after that famous Tom Ford fragrance, but it's possible that that line smelling like a brick could be a gentle nod to the fact that Pusha T built his whole career off of rapping about bricks of coke. Following that with the line degenerates, maybe he's saying his own crew are degenerates, or maybe he's saying that those people that concern with selling bricks are degenerates, followed with the line even Ellen loves our shit, a possible hint towards the fact that Pusha T's drug dealer raps never went mainstream. And in the next line, Drake makes it very clear that this song is aimed at those people hating on him, but not naming names, saying that he's gonna silence his haters and he's too busy to worry about what they're saying anyway. And then he drops another line that that could easily be interpreted as being aimed at pushers referring to 90s fantasies. Which again, could be another close diss aimed at Pusha T, suggesting that all of his raps are just dated references to his potentially embellished past of being a drug dealer in the 90s. Drake is suggesting that he has really made his own dreams come true, while Push is still just sitting around reminiscing on his unproven drug dealer past. Now look, some of that is reaching, but for all of the hate that Drake gets for having ghostwriters, stuff like this seems very personal to him. And the shit that Drake does write seems to be very well thought out, layered, deep and extremely pointed at the people he's had issues with. But as slick as those bars were, you must never underestimate the ruthlessness of the Pusher T-1000. Around a month after Drake's Tuscan Leather dropped in October 2013, Pusha T clapped back on the Pharrell produced track Suicide, a track that seems clearly aimed at Drake due to the lyrics that seem to refer to his song titles like headlines, as well as inferring to the fact that Drake built his career off the back of Wayne and Baby. Push went on to drop a line suggesting that people are ganging up with his rivals to go against him, going on to say, like I can't see the scenes that you mirror in your idol, but a pawn's only purpose is completely suicidal, seemingly suggesting that he can see Drake mirroring the situation that Pusha already had with Lil Wayne, and or suggesting that Drake will end up mirroring the contractual dispute situation that Wayne had with Birdman. A line which Pusha T later elaborated on a little more with Genius, saying that he felt the likes of Lil Wayne and Birdman were using the new blood Drake as a pawn in their existing beef. I feel like my rivals use these, use these youngins to do things like that, you know, and they'll use their uh, popularity and so on and so forth. And that's why I was like, a pawn's only purpose is completely suicidal. Like, you know, I might just have to off, you know, off the pawns too. <laughs> now this didn't get an immediate response from Drake, and so Push continued prodding cash money like he was trying to check a fake bill, dropping the track more famous than Rich at the end of 2015 on his King Push Darkest Before Dawn The Prelude album. The track itself has been interpreted as yet another sneak diss towards Drake and Wayne, with the overall suggestion of the entire song suggesting that if you're down with a label like Cash Money, they're gonna end up stealing all your cash money, regardless of how famous you might end up, hence the term 
more famous than rich. Of course, with that in mind, Pusha T went on to drop lines referencing being paid in full, which we assume that Drake and Wayne are not since they're in business with Birdman. And of course, the verses included more lines interpreted as Drake disses. Lines about songs having dances, a likely reference to Drake's iconic dance from Hotline Bling that was released the summer before this song. And Pusha T even dragged another former Young Money big cat into the beef, saying that he thought Tiger was a genius for leaving cash money. And Pusha T confirmed this is exactly what he meant in an annotation on Tiger.com. I mean, genius.com. He doubles down on that sentiment with lines saying why are the biggest rappers in the game broke, which seems to me much more aimed at Wayne than Drake, since there's never really been any suggestion that Drake is not completely filthy rich, even in spite of him getting shafted by Birdman. The next line suggests that rap fans have been lied to by the likes of Forbes about Birdman and Lil Wayne's wealth, a line which Pusha T confirmed once again with Tiger. I mean, genius. Now, not only had Lil Wayne already tapped out of this beef with Pusha T in 2013 after Ghoulish flopped, but even if he did want to respond, he couldn't, since by this point he was already beefing with Birdman about his contract and he couldn't even release music. And before Drake even had a chance to clap back with more sneak disses, Pusha T was going back to back on Drake, and not just with bars either, but in a series of very smart chess moves. Pusha T gets promoted to the president of Good Music and swiftly brings under Good Music management none other than former cash money artist genius, Tiger, I mean Tiger. But then beyond industry backroom finesses, Pusha T then backs his beef with music. In October 2016, dropping the track HGTV, sneaking shots at Drizzy once again on a cool disjointed Mike Will made it be. And even though Pusha has claimed that his line in this song about Jokers at the top being a simple Batman reference, I ain't buying it. I think he's referring to Drake out of the gate with this song, and he's too smart not to have realized just how that line was gonna be taken. Too smart for your own good, Push. At the end of the song, he drops bars that are clearly pointed at Drake, saying the game is too far gone when the realist ain't real, too far gone, of course, one of Drake's classic tapes, calling the Cash Money crew some Call of Duty Nigels because their killings ain't real, then finally dropping another line yet again calling Drake's pen game questionable. Yet another reference to the ghostwriting allegations that are still dogging Drake's career to this day. Push then contrasts Drake's ghostwriting ways with his own superior pen game, comparing himself to the author John Grisham, ironically something that Drake had done himself in his past career back when he did a swagger like us freestyle. Push then elaborates to say that the rap game bar has been duly lowered, a direct rebuttal of Drake's line in Tuscan Leather, where he said that he sets the bar and people fall under it. With Push finishing out the track, confirming that he is so top five, once again, another direct rebuttal from Drake's lines in Dreams Money Can Buy about Pusher falling out of his top Top five. Frankly, a heavyweight response from Pusher, and by this point, we've not heard a great deal of rebuttal from Drake. But eventually, Drake stepped up to the plate and went at Push for the team, dropping a significant escalation that would lead to the fiery crescendo of this rap beef. In October 2016, Drake released the song Two Birds, One Stone, a track apparently directed at Pusha T and Kid Cudi, and maybe low-key Kanye too. Obviously, we know that the Drake-Kanye West Cold War has been raging on at this point, and Kid Cudi had already involved himself in this beef previously, piping up on Twitter in response to Lil Wayne, saying fuck Pusha T and anybody that love him, replying saying fuck anybody that don't like Push. However, the Drake-Kid Cudi beef, that's for another day. But if you want me to cover that, go follow me on Instagram at TrapLordRoss and drop me a DM saying that you want to hear that Drake Cuddy beef. So anyway, the track Two Birds, One Stone is the stone. And the two birds that Drake is referring to are Pusha T and Kid Cudi. And the song's name itself has also been interpreted as a little bit of a subtle diss towards Pusha T. As of course, birds are a colloquial term for bricks of cocaine. You know, the stuff that Pusha T claims to have sold a bunch of. And for the record, with that metaphor in mind, some people have even suggested that this song is actually going after three people, two fake drug dealers, Pusha T and Meek Mill, them being the bricks, and one stoner being Kid Cudi, the stone. But I mean, whatever, take it how you want. Because this song's most important target was Pusha T. And what could possibly be a more disrespectful birthday present for somebody that spent their entire life reliant on their reputation as an ex-drug dealer than a song casting doubt on the authenticity of that drug dealing past? So once Drake gets into it, he takes aim at Pusha directly, saying, but really it's you with all the drug dealer stories. That's got to stop though. You made a couple chops, now you think that you choppo. If you ask me though, you ain't lying in the trunk with kilos and lines like, this what we need to be on, but you never went live. You middleman in this shit. Boy, you were never them guys. I can tell because most of you look dead in your eyes and you'll be trying to sell that story for the rest of your lives. Hey, for once, these lyrics don't need much interpretation. He's clearly going at Pusher, doubting his dope boy credentials, which whether or not you believe it is pretty disrespectful. Now for the record, many people point to the fact that the Clips' former manager, Anthony Jeezy Gonzalez, got indicted as part of a massive cocaine ring as proof of the fact that Pusher T and the Clips were really connected to the real dons in the dope game. I mean, this guy allegedly imported a ton of weed 
an actual ton and 100 pounds of blow into Virginia from South America. Jeezy actually got 32 years in jail after pleading guilty. And sure, Pusha T and Malice's specific proximity to that dope dealing operation have always been up for debate, but let's keep it 100. Pusha T was around this shit. But again, that's a story for another day. But anyway, Drake goes on further, suggesting that Pusha T's bank balance doesn't match his kingpin backstory. Just one final sprinkle of salt on a delicious sauteed bed of beef. Now, naturally, Pusha T does not take kindly to Drake's suggestion that he was never a real dope dealer. So he quickly replied to Drake's allegations, but not in song form, with an excellent complex cover story. Now, this was actually a really well-written and genuinely interesting long form article with its main focus on the systemic incarceration of young black men, seemingly tied to Pusha T's ongoing support of Hillary Clinton's election campaign around this time, as part of his ongoing efforts to get involved with the prison reform agenda. Now, I personally think that Hillary should have let Pusha T write her a few speeches, because maybe then she'd have won that beef with Trump. But anyway, in this article, Pusha T explains how him and his friends got into the dope game as kids, also inferring that when the clip's record sales slumped in 2006, for a short period of time, he even had to slip back into his old ways playing around in the dope game, and discussing how when that manager, Anthony Gizzi Gonzalez, was picked up by the feds, many of Pusha's friends went down too, even saying that that indictment specifically stated that drug money had been laundered through many legal businesses associated with Pusha T, including the Clips' booking agency. In fact, it was these events that actually preceded Pusha's brother and partner in the Clips, Malice, changing his name to No Malice and completely disavowing drugs and violence. And again, that's a whole other story. Now, I was disappointed that at no point in this interview does Pusha give us the real truth, the fact that none of his dope dealing past is true, and he was really just sent back in time from the year 3000 to kill Drake's career before he had a chance to ruin hip hop history forever. I need your gun, your beats, and your owl pendant. But really though, Pusha ends the interview explosively rebuffing Drake's claims, once and for all in the most stern fashion possible, saying my past is cemented, my past happened, like slavery happened, like the Holocaust happened and going on to suggest that Drake should be ashamed of being associated with the sentiments in the track Two Birds, One Stone, saying you cannot deny something that really happened. Now, the gravity of Pusha's words in this interview came down with the weight of an OVO tour bus full of BBWs on the way to Drake's mansion, with Pusha T ending the interview very ominously. When he's asked if he believes that Drake's lines in that song were truly directed at him, he says, it ain't real if it's about me. Now, it's a good thing that Pusha T managed to get a bit of a response across in that complex interview after Two Birds, One Stone released. Because due to the long-winded process of Kanye West having his first mental breakdown within a couple of months of that disc dropping, combined with the fact that once Kanye did recover, his work on Pusha T's next album was plagued with delays. His third solo album was supposed to be King Push, with that previous album being the prelude to King Push. But due to so many delays, Pusha T ended up renaming this album Daytona, an obvious nod to his favorite line of Rolex watches, but also using this timepiece title as a metaphor for having the luxury of time. And considering what this album contained in regards to Drake, I wouldn't be surprised if this title was yet another coded message about the excruciatingly long period of time that it had taken Pusha to reply to Drake's diss song, which was over a year prior. Or maybe the timepiece metaphor is really referring to the amount of time that it took Pusha to come up with what ended up being the most devastating set of chess moves the rap game has ever seen. Now, Daytona was entirely produced by Kanye West, which in itself is significant when you consider the Cold War that had been going on between Drake and Kanye at this point. Now, Drake and Ye's beef had seemingly been called to a truce for a short period as Drake flew out to Wyoming to take part in a reconciliatory recording session with Kanye, a session that we now know ended up going a little south. But before we even get into that devastating diss track from Daytona Infrared, a lot of people overlook the fact that Pusha T was already pre-beefing with Drake on the penultimate track of that Daytona album, What Would Meek Do? An obvious nod to Drake's other most famous op, Meek Mill, and a track which in my opinion is massively overlooked in the Drake Pusha T beef saga. As that track starts out with a Kanye initiated lyric trolling Drake's earlier lines about Pusha T falling out of his top five. Kanye says, they talking shit, Push, how do you respond? Push says, I'm top five and all of them die long. Die long, of course, a reference to the famous delusional rapper from P Diddy's reality show making the band. I'm making history right now. Don't try to water me down and change my style. Of course, this iconic clown being immortalized forever by Dave Chappelle's impression of him on Chappelle's show. Who are the five best rappers of all time? Dylan, 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 and Dylan. And the Chappelle Show reference is even more relevant because let's not forget the fact that earlier on, Pusha T compared Drake's relationship with ghostwriters to Dave Chappelle's relationship with his co-writer Neil Brennan, tying everything together in a neat little package. God damn, Push, you're a mastermind. He goes on to drop the line from the song's title, asking what would Meek do in the same situation as Push? Of course, in this case, Pusha is referring to Meek popping wheelies and telling the judge to put it in their mouth. I personally think that here, Pusha T 
is really saying what would Meek do if it came to exposing Drake. And of course, we know exactly what Meek did, airing out Drake's dirty laundry on Twitter and exposing him to initiate their ill-fated beef after he found out that Drake had used a ghostwriter on their collab track, Rico. But here's where it gets deep, because in the second verse, Pusha returns that same question to Kanye. They talking shit, yay? How do you respond? And Kanye says, poop, poopity scoop. Another obvious reference to the fact that during Kanye and Drake's beef, Kanye took the beat Lift Yourself that Drake had said he wanted to record on and decided to release it publicly with him shouting a bunch of poopity scoop gibberish over it just to troll Drake. Now this line once again seems like a very pointed diss towards Drake, perhaps placed in this song specifically by Pusha T to involve Kanye in the beef. But anyway, What Would Meek Do was the perfect setup for the one-two punch that Pusha was about to deliver with that final track from Daytona, Infrared. Now Infrared is so laden with obvious Drake disses that you should just go and listen to it yourself now because it needs so little interpretation. What's really important about Infrared isn't the specific lines that Pusha is using to diss Drake, but it's the fronts on Drake's character that Pusha T is choosing to attack. And looking at this allows us to see what a smart chess move releasing infrared was because of the sheer amount of foreshadowing in there for what was about to come after. Firstly, Pusha accuses Drake of using ghostwriters, naming Drake's alleged ghostwriter Quentin Miller by name, leaving no room for doubt as to who exactly this track is taking aim at. Secondly, he questions Drake's blackness, referencing how Jay-Z didn't get the recognition he deserved until he sampled Annie on the track Hard Knock Life, with Push saying that he doesn't tap dance for crackers, essentially suggesting that Drake has had to betray his roots in order to go mainstream. He goes on to reiterate that he was right all along about Birdman shafting people for money, and shouted out Rick Ross for being one of the few people that had the gall to call out Birdman on his behavior, saying it pains him to see Wayne broke on tour trying to make ends meet. And then finally, he rebuffs Drake's claims that Pusha T embellished his drug dealing past, saying the only rapper that sold more dope than him was Easy e Now, Infrared is a strong diss from Push, but the thing is here, it doesn't really cover that much new ground. The smart move here was going at Drake no more viciously than he had done in the past, but much more specifically. This was a diss that was so clearly pointed at Drake in a way that was obvious to everybody that there was no way Drake couldn't respond. And Drake would make an immediate reply. But in doing so, he opened up a whole can of worms that would soon spill down his front like a bunch of pissy baked beans in a screening for Cars 2. Now, to his credit, Drake rode out on the metaphorical op block the very same day, coming back with an instant rebuttal, swiftly dropping his reply, the Duppy Freestyle. The title Duppy being a neat little reference to the 2006 diss that British grime rapper Skepta did on Mega Man. Not necessarily helping Drake with the old culture vulture allegations that Push even mentioned himself on Infrared. Anyway, while I personally do actually like the Duppy Freestyle, and I genuinely think that Drake raps and wrote very well on the song, he majorly fucked up from the very beginning. Because as we learned in the video about Drake and Kanye's beef, Drake used the majority of his airtime on this duppy response, taking pot shots at Kanye West. This mainly being due to wanting to point out the hypocrisy of Pusha dissing Drake for using ghostwriters, when Drake had literally just been in Wyoming ghostwriting for Kanye's Ye album. Even elsewhere in the song, Drake is going much harder at Kanye than he is at Pusha. For example, dissing Kanye for being jealous of Virgil Abloh. Problem here is that rather than hitting two birds with one stone, he barely grazes either of these birds to take home a single W. In this song, he barely has any lines that are scathing towards Pusha T. Flip in the infrared title, saying that Pusha T's head is now in Drake's beam, and once again referencing that beaten to death put down about Pusha T not being in his top five anymore, suggesting that Pusha T isn't even top five on his own record label. And doubling down on doubting Pusha T's street credentials, saying the real drug dealers were Pusha T's cousin and brother, and saying that Pusha T just raps about what they did. And then in my opinion, Drake kind of takes a subtle L here, admitting that Pusha T might have sold some blow to buy sneakers and a Mercedes, but then saying that he's no Pablo Escobar. Now Drake, Pusha T never claimed to be selling blow like Escobar. He's always made it clear that he got in the dope game for fly cars and fly fashion. So at this point in the beef, Drake is really beginning to sound kind of dithering and uninformed, reaching for the same old tired lines that he'd used on Pusha T before. Though I've got to give Drake credit, the one smart thing that he did do was get ahead of a potential put down about him owning that signed Pusha T mic back in the day, saying, I had a microphone of yours, but the signature faded. I think that pretty much resembles what's been happening lately. He then goes on to diss Pusha T for being older than Kanye. And now, at the end of the song, he drops a very lacklustre line, which is the one that Pusha T claims pushed him over the edge. A fairly innocuous line where he refers to Pusha T's fiance, Virginia Williams, saying he's going to let it ring on him, because, you know, when you, you propose, you, you wear a ring. Uh, nice one, Drake. It doesn't really have much bite, does it? But then again, what with Drake's habit of supposedly running around smashing people's wives and girlfriends for revenge? I could understand why mentioning Pusha T's fiance by name might have gotten under his skin. But it's the final line of the song that's a poetic moment where the whole Pusha T, Lil Wayne, 
helping Birdman cash money beef finally becomes full circle. As Drake says, I told Wheezy and Baby I'm a done him for you. Tell Ye we got an invoice coming to you, considering we just sold another 20 for you. Now this is obviously a reference to the fact that Pusha T has been at Lil Wayne and Birdman's necks for around 12 years at this point. And that line about the invoice has been considered by many to be a deep coded message about the very dispute that kicked off this whole Pusha T cash money beef all to begin with. The mythical unpaid invoice for Pharrell's beat on Birdman's clips collaboration What Happened to That Boy. And I've just got a one time for that song. Even after the beef, Pusha T tweeted at Drake saying, send that invoice. And by God, Drake actually sent the invoice to Pusha T, posting it up on his Instagram and even tagging Push, with the invoice claiming to be for promotional assistance and career reviving. Oh boy, if only Drake knew just how much career reviving he would need in a few days time. I think hip hop fans will always remember where they were when Pusha T released the story of Adidon. From the moment that I saw that cover art with Drake in full blackface, I knew then Drizzy had fucked up big time. And from the moment that you press play on that song, line after scathing line from Pusha T, each hit like another nail in Drake's coffin. And look, nobody can end Drake's career except for those young girls. He's too big to fail. But the story of Adidon was public humiliation dialed up to 10. Disrespect that the most popular rapper in human history thought that he was completely above. So let's break it down. Pusha starts off combining that disrespectful cover art with lyrics attacking Drake's mixed race heritage. And don't forget, this is something that Pusha was teeing up for in infrared with the lines about tap dancing for crackers. And before we get into the big huggies wearing elephant in the room, let's talk about Pusha T rebuffing that line about his fiance Virginia Williams. As Pusha T suggests that from this line, he feels like Drake talks about marriage like it's a bad thing. Once again, referencing Drake's father walking out on him and suggesting that Drake doesn't look after his mum. But the reason Pusha brings up Drake's dad isn't just to perpetuate an unfair stereotype, but it's actually to prod further at Drake's own complicated relationship with his race. Seemingly suggesting that he parades his black father around in public, despite the fact that he walked out on Drake as a kid and betrayed him, suggesting that Drake is doing this to improve his image as a black man, because as Pusha puts it, he never felt black enough. Now, not really something that I am qualified to psychoanalyze at all, but my God, does that sound very disrespectful. And speaking of disrespect, near the end of the song, Pusha T says that Drake's day one friend and producer, 40, is hunched over like he's 80 and dying, a reference to 40's ongoing battle with multiple sclerosis. Now, for the record, I just want to say, it's clear that Pusha T is using this information against Drake as a diff, but I don't think there's anything here to suggest that Pusha T was wishing death on 40 or mocking his illness. It sounds more to me that if you really look at this line, Pusha is prodding Drake to say, hey, your golden boy beat maker that makes your hits won't be here for long. And when that happens, your hit records are gonna dry up. Which hey, in some ways is almost a little bit of an underhanded compliment to 40's beat making abilities. He is genuinely very good. And 40 actually responded to this line in a very classy way, simply sharing the fact that the following day after this song dropped was World MS Day. And look, I know that Drake loves to cling on to this particular line about 40 as the moment that the beef went too far and push wish death on another man. You know, wishing like that my friend that has an illness like dies. Uh, like though that shit to me is just not really wavy. Hey, come on, let's be real. All is fair in love and beef. And I personally believe that Drake's fixation on how disrespectful this particular line was is really just a flimsy tactic of trying to steer the conversation away from that devastating love child reveal. But of course, all of that trash talk was simply window dressing for the main diss here, which was Pusha T's supposed reveal that Drake had a secret child. Naming Drake's baby mother as former French glamour model, Sophie Brousseau, and revealing her past as an adult film star. Insulting her background and suggesting that Drake tried to clean up her image. Push goes on to suggest that Drake is being finessed on child support before truly going for the jugular and suggesting that Drake himself is an absentee father like his was. All because he won't let Sophie Brousseau and Adonis into his life. And then Push goes on to reveal Drake's son's name to the world, along with the supposed info that Drake was planning to reveal his kid to the world as part of an Adidas range called Addy Don. And this came months after it was rumored that Drake was leaving his Nike deal for Adidas. But of course, now we know that never happened. I mean, look, this is completely scathing stuff from the Pusha T1000 here. I mean, has anyone ever been more disrespectful in a rap beef than this? I mean, I swear there's no other way to look at it other than Pusha T murdered Drake on every single front. He hit him with infrared. Drake quickly clapped back and thought he had it patterned. And then boom, story of added on dropped. Pusha T had Drake bent out of shape and then swimming in a sea of L's. I mean, the Pusha T 1000 knew all of the perfect moves to make in this beef. It was like he could see the past, the future and everything in between, doing everything he needed to do and drop in the story of added on to ensure that for once and for all, Drake had been duly terminated.
Now, before I let you go, I have a couple of theories about this beef that I've not heard many other people share. I truly believe that from the outside, while it looks like Pusha T had explosive inside information about Drake and his personal life, just like a good magician, a lot of what Pusha T actually attacked Drake on was really just based on sleight of hand maneuvers, which Drake clearly didn't see coming. And I believe that in reality, Pusha T never really had that much dirt on Drake. He was really just bluffing and playing a bad hand the entire time. Now, there's been a lot of speculation in the hip hoposphere as to just how Pusha T got the inside information about Drake's secret love chart. Drake inferred that Pusha got the information from Kanye West when he was talking with LeBron James on the shop, of course, after having famously visited Kanye's Wyoming studio around the same time that Pusha T had. And so, you know, I was in the studio. I guess, you know, we all kind of felt a genuine vibe from him. In Wyoming, I play on March 14th. I send him a picture of my son. Now, Pusha T rebuffed this theory when he was on the Joe Budden podcast, saying that he got the info secondhand from a woman that Drake's producer 40 had supposedly been pillow talking with. The information came from 40. It didn't come from Kanye. 40 is sleeping with a woman who begins to, you know, you know, he talks to her every, he talks to her daily, five, six hours a day. Oh, she must have a great personality. Yeah, bruh. With that, also came the fact that Drake has a child. However, I personally don't buy that either. I've got absolutely no proof of this, but I honestly believe that Pusha T is just saying this to mess with Drake's head and make him doubt his own camp. Because the story of Added On dropped on May the 29th, 2018. And because of how explosively Pusha T seemed to expose Drake's hidden child, it came off to most casual listeners as if Pusha T had this big insider info. But the very idea that Drake was hiding his child is kind of an overstatement. Because outlets like TMZ were already reporting on these rumors as early as 2017, openly suggesting that Drake had a paternity suit brewing with Sophie Brousseau long before Pusha T had ever rapped about it. And this is including paparazzi pictures of them together in Amsterdam, supposedly around the time Drake put that baby in her. Even back in 2017, TMZ supposedly had the text between Drake and Sophie Brousseau where he was pressuring her to hit Apple Q on that fetus. Elsewhere in that same 2017 article, there's another line suggesting that Sophie Brousseau had had a fling with another rapper around this time. Hell, who knows, maybe in another world this kid could have ended up ASAP Adonis. But of course, the cherry on top of all of this is in that same article, a statement seemingly from Drake's team disparaging Sophie's character, calling her out saying that she has multiple relationships, a questionable background, and problems getting into the United States. Deadbeat motherfucker playing Border Patrol indeed. In fact, Adidas deal aside, there's enough in this TMZ article alone to account for a large amount of the lines in the story of Adidon. Pusha could have written that song with this article alone, no insider info. This to me proves two things. Firstly, Drake's supposed love child was already public knowledge, but people just didn't take as much of an interest in it until it was confirmed. And secondly, Pusha T is a genius because he weaponized Drake's kid in the beef. Maybe he did have some behind the scenes confirmation that it was indeed true, but at this point, Drake's paternity suit didn't have much public profile and Drake had not publicly commented on it. Whether or not Pusha T had read this article and had some specific confirmation that it was true, or he just found the article and knew then that he'd copped the mother load of dirt on Drake. By presenting the rumors that were already out there as true fact, Pusha T weaponized this info. He knew that Drake was trying to hide this information, so Pusha T put him on blast publicly. And Drake was left in a complete lose-lose situation where he would either be forced to respond respond and say that it was untrue, or take the L and say that it was true, any which way you look at it, Drake has taken an L. The info had already been out there for a year, but most people didn't know this until Pusha T put it on wax in an explosive and entertaining fashion. Because information that's just circulating on TMZ and gossip racks is essentially worthless until someone like Pusha T comes along, weaponizes it, and uses it to beat Drake half to death in front of the whole world. And in many ways, Drake and his team sealed their own fate by being so disrespectful to Sophie Brousseau back when this story was just a rumor. When Pusha drops the line, forget she's a porn star, let her be your world, have so much more bite when you look back at that TMZ article and realize that Drake and his team were dragging this woman because of her past in public not even that long ago. Drake bought this situation on self by dragging an innocent and honest woman's background and character through the mud in front of the whole world just to try and deflect a paternity suit. Not a good look on Drake's behalf. So regardless of who, how, or why this information ended up leaking to the public, Pusha T handed Drake an enormous capital L just by using this info in the way that he did. Hell, at this point, Drake should name his son Adon L. And of course, naturally, with no options and no Ws in sight, when it came to Drake's response, we got nothing but disappointment. Before we go any further, let's just check in and see what Ja Rule has to say about this. 
Okay, great. Really though, after the story of Adidon dropped, Drake had a whole lot of explaining to do. There was the blackface picture, which wasn't such a good look. After releasing it, Pusha T tweeted to say that that image was not artwork, but a real picture, further trying to drag Drake's struggles with his self-identity. And while the response didn't immediately come from Drake, the photographer who took it began to have his comments bombarded by people referencing this beef. And while he initially defended the photos, saying that the shoot was all Drake's idea and his concept, accidental confirmation that the images were indeed genuine, he went on to elaborate that the images were supposed to be part of an art project with the aim of provoking thought around black identity. But the OVO goons probably got in touch with him and applied some pressure because not long later, the photographer was on Twitter begging Pusha T's manager to take the pictures down. Eventually succeeding in getting that original post that Pusha T had put on his Instagram taken down by a DMCA request. Meanwhile, the Jim Crow tee that Drake was wearing in this image was also under fire. Turns out that this was actually as part of a subversive clothing line started by some artists known as Two Black Guys, who also came out to support Drake, saying that the t-shirt design was a political statement, and then finally Drake even came out himself to respond, explaining that the picture was from 2007 when he was still an actor, and the project was an artistic photo shoot, and that what they were trying to do was use blackface to highlight the frustration that young black actors face when struggling to get roles in the industry. Okay, Drake. Many people didn't buy it, including Pusha T, who went and did an interview on 92.3, saying that Drake is silent on all black issues. You are silent in all black issues, Drake. You really are. Like you and you got you have all the platform in the world. You were so passionate back then? No, you weren't. In fact, Pusha T went on a mini press run doing numerous interviews saying that he was not expecting any reply from Drizzy Drake himself. Even going as far as to say that the story of Adidon was just the first layer and that if Drake did want to keep going with the beef, he's got multiple layers to pull back on Drake from there. It's layer. I, listen, I told I told you at the end of this joint. We, gon we can take this slow. I'm just peeling back the first layer. Now look, I've done some digging and I feel like I've got a pretty good idea of what Pusher is referring to when he says that he's got other layers of dirt on Drake. But I'm honestly, I'm not even gonna get into that stuff because it's very NSFW. All I'll say is there are definitely some hints in the story of Adidon and if you know, you know. But beyond the disrespect and embarrassment, let's take a look at the financial side. Because after this disastrous diss song, we never saw any Adidas line from Drake. And of course, we now know that he ended up doubling down on his Nike deal in a big way. And Drake even mentioned that he was in Indeed planning on working with Adidas in his interview with Rap Radar. At the time I was working with Adidas and we were toying with the idea of a name being a play off of a name uh, off of my son's name. So it's unclear the extent to which Pusha T's diss track put a stink on Drake's Adidas deal, but it's highly possible that either Drake or Adidas were forced to walk away due to the bad publicity, and you can bet that Pusha T probably cost Drake a pretty penny. And hey, then again, we all know that Pusha T has his own Adidas deal, so it's not unthinkable that Drake might have made the decision that he don't want to mess with Adidas, knowing that they support the ops. And of course, one more loose end of this entire beef was Drake's supposed scathing diss track response that never came. As we discussed in the Drake vs. Kanye Kanye beef video, Drake had supposedly recorded a devilish response that many said was more aimed at Kanye than Push, with many suggesting that the song would include the suggestion that Drake had piped down Kim Kardashian. However, fortunately for Kanye and Pusha T, Drake's Houston sugar daddy Jay Prince crawled out the woodwork to say that he'd made an OG call and convinced Drake not to release this devastating diss. Because of course this diss song would have been so good, so devastating to the ops that oh they just wouldn't be able to live with themselves. Do the right thing, Drake. You talk with Drake and you told him to no longer respond to Pusha T. Right. Was cocked and loaded. This could have been a career ending situation where he could serve. And it also could have damaged, uh, I think, a whole lot of uh, livelihood where, where people are concerned. Drake later actually backed up this unproven rumor on his appearance on Rap Radar, saying that he felt he was saying things in this supposed diss track that was so bad he wouldn't have wanted to hear himself saying them two years later. And when I was making, when I was making the record, in response, which was a real record, I know people think it's like some myth, um, and saying things that I, didn't, I don't know if in two years I'd want to hear myself say. But for the record, many of the fans, myself included, and Pusha T, don't really think that Drake had that career-ending response. No, you fucking didn't. You believe that. I don't believe that. No, I said I believe he had recorded a record. Listen, he probably recorded something. Maybe it truly was a career-ending diss track where he spilled the beans on everyone. Or maybe it was just a two-hour recording of him crying in the shower after hearing Addy Don. It doesn't matter, because after the story of Addy Don dropped, Drake was done out here. It was over! And even though when Pusha T was in Toronto, a bunch of guys threw beer on him at the stage, something people have said that Drake paid to make happen, not very mob ties, is it? Ultimately, everything that happened afterwards was completely inconsequential. Drake had to hold this L. He had to.
And even when Drake eventually did do that big interview on Rap Radar, he essentially said that the beef was over at the point that that song dropped, even giving credit to Pusha T for the genius chess moves that he had made to this point. I have no desire to ever mend anything with that person. The information was too shocking. It was, like I said, it was, it was a, on his part, it was a genius chess move. He obviously has no like, you know, when it comes to me, he's not gonna have any like morals or respect. I've got to give respect to Drake. At least he's not delusional. And he can even be a big enough man to admit that he took the enormous L from Pusha T revealing his child in such a humiliating fashion. So it's not really much I can say big, better than Drake has a baby. I, he won, you know, he won off that. Look, I know what some people are thinking. Oh, Trap Law Ross, you're such a Drake hater. Oh, this video is so biased, you're just making Pusha T out to be the good guy. Drake is the real MVP, he's got more slaps than the Beatles, Ree! Well, the facts are, Pusha T won this beef. He made 10 years of chess moves to get the drop on Drizzy. He was able to completely devastate Drake with information that was already circulating anyway. But the way he did it was enough to humiliate the biggest rapper that hip hop has ever seen in his prime. This was the most devastating diss song in hip hop history. And the Pusha T Drake beef will probably go down as the most iconic beef in hip hop history. Even if you disagree, we've seen what Pusha T is capable of. Why do you think all the jokes in this video are directed towards Drake? I don't wanna get on Pusha T's bad side, would you? I've got too many skeletons in my closet for that shit. So Pusha T is and forever will be the king of rap beef and he will remain so for the foreseeable future. And I would like to think that even Drake himself could be humble and agree, and at least in some small way be grateful for the role he played in receiving the most iconic L the rap game has ever seen. So kids, the lesson of today's video is very simple. Don't ever, ever get on the wrong side of Pusha T1000 or you will be terminated.